I assume a lot of you have had the experience where you feel like the world's coming in and you have to ask, what do I want, right? What do I want? How do I want to resolve this? What kind of person do I want to be? And where do I want to go? And so it's because you have this idea of something greater than what's right you're in the middle of that you can uh, transcend it, right? Not just passively react. You can creatively create something better. And I think a lot of you were talking about that last time. Um, he's just saying that actually over all these years, we, we literally have made our minds more complex and they've grown, the mind, the brain has grown because we've used it in this way that keeps um, helping it expand and also the complexity of the neural maps and things. So we inherit the, all the history of this effort toward a better life and then we have to decide, you know, what sort of effort do we want to pass on to the next generation? And that's a big theme, you know, in all religious literature. So um, let's go to the next one, though. We were at the, the number two was revenge. Oh, sorry. Um, Titus was going to report on his paper because he didn't make it last time. So go ahead, Titus. Okay, so what I decided to do was kind of talk about Socrates and his corruption or alleged corruption of the youth. That's how he was judged and trial. So my going through the dialogues and mainly his defense in court, I pretty much came to the conclusion that all he was really accused for was embarrassing those who were above him. And I kind of glossed over this, uh, I think a couple class periods ago, but really all I saw that he did throughout the dialogues was go and question the those who were supposedly wise and basically prove that they weren't as wise as they thought they were. And by doing that, he built enemies because obviously if someone comes to your place and proves that you're not what you think you are then I don't think you'll like them too much so I had some quotes that I went some key quotes that I went to prove this and since they're pretty long I'm gonna summarize them so one example was how he was talking about basically an oracle that described him as the wisest person. And obviously Socrates being the person he is did not want to believe that because he was being humble. So instead of just getting cocky, he decided to go and out and prove it by going on a journey, by going to the wisest people, interviewing them and seeing what they really know compared to what he know. And to whenever he went to one, he basically figured they always thought themselves wise, but didn't really, they didn't really know anything. And he figured they're basically like him, except they just didn't want to admit it was like him, meaning that they didn't want to admit they were unintelligent because they didn't want to look bad in front of other people. So one quote of his was that, and I, this was him talking to the court of Athens and talking about his journey. So he said, go, I must all to appear to know and find the meaning of the oracle. And I swear to you, Athens, for I must tell you the truth. The result of my mission was just this. I found that men most in repute and reputation were all but mo the most foolish and that some inferior men were really wiser and better. When I left 
the politicians, I went to poets of all sorts. And there I said to myself, you will be detected. Now you will find out you are more ignorant than they are. So basically what he did to all of them, he basically read their most elaborate writings, basically all the things that they were somewhat famous and looked up to for. And he basically wondered if he could learn something. And it he ended up being, he said he was ashamed to say it, but there was hardly a person who would not talk better about poetry, meaning that it all sounded good, but it really didn't talk about nothing. So he said, they, sh they showed me in an instant that not by wisdom do poets write poetry, but by a sort of genius and inspiration. They are like diviners or soothsayers who, are, who also say many fine things, but do not understand the meaning of them. So that was just another example of how they're basically just all talk. And when he went and pretty much proved this, they all rebelled against him because really they were embarrassed and it eventually led him to being in court and being accused of something he really didn't do. And this had, was involved with the youth as well it was basically all the same. So in my opinion, he shouldn't have been accused of really anything wrong, which means he obviously shouldn't have been trialed and ruled to die. And that was pretty much it. And I also assumed that he knew that he was going to die the second he went to court because he pretty much knew how they all think thought based off his own experiences. Okay, anybody want a question or a comment for Titus? I'll make a comment. I'm um, just at the end where you said that um, he went into court like basically knowing that he would die. Um, like, do you think that's why that he gave? Uh, what was his name? Sorry, what the C? Cry yeah, didn't he give him the, like, basically told him about how to take care of his kids and his legacy? I never thought about him thinking that he was going to die. He might have said that. We might have talked about that, but I didn't know about that. Not only <laughs> that, does he have a reason to have a lot of confidence that Crito is going to tell his kids the right things? <laughs> as far as the confidence that Crito was going to tell his kids the right thing, you can't be too sure. Well, not only that, Crito thought, you know, I gave your dad a chance to go to Thessaly and raise you guys, and he didn't do it, you know? Right. Oh, <laughs> so that's what I was saying. Crito was also one of those people who cared greatly about how his reputation and how it was viewed in public. So as far as if he, I don't think he'd tell his kids anything bad, but he makes sure that his reputation is safe. And I figured he, Socrates, already knew. I figured he must have already thought of the arguments that Kratos was going to say and discuss with him while he was in jail because of all of his experiences, basically. It all went exactly the same. Right. So Socrates knew there were a lot of false rumors against him before he ever got, right? Okay, you guys. Do students at Lyon tell false rumors about each other? No, nobody in this room. Okay. I honestly think that is the worst poison to the Lyon model of liberal education is false rumors. Does that make sense? Because if you think about it, I mean, all of you are, you have to be the hope you want to see in the world, right? I think all of you are that person that's gonna build the bridge, right? That person that's gonna to try to heal the wounds and try to move us forward. Um, and lots of times it's first generation college students because the ones who you know, are fourth generation, they just use college for their own purposes. 
but lots of times it's first generation who know, you know, that this is different. And then they are motivated to try and do fulfill the mission because they sort of understand the extremes. Um, so, but you know, when false rumors come in there, it really ruins the culture. So I advise you just please don't do that. <laughs> um, or just try to notice how harmful that is. And try to like cut off uh, somebody you know, like a friend and say, are you sure? And then say, well, why is that so bad? I mean, aren't you creating more harm than good by talking behind someone's back like that? Anyway, all right, so let's go to revenge and forgiveness. Um, anybody want to start? I'll just start in the middle somewhere. Jason, you want to start? Who do I need to take revenge on? Like, who owes me? <laughs> uh i don't know okay caitlin will you do it yeah i guess i don't have a lot to say but um this is like the mccullough yeah stuff isn't we it didn't get okay. to do it last time yeah i don't have a whole lot on it but um i thought it was interesting how he described anger as like a moral response um I wrote down not getting angry when you should is a vice because you're not holding others accountable. Um, I thought that was interesting because like you wouldn't think that you're like you would think that you're not supposed to be angry like you're not supposed to lash out at others not lash out's kind of a strong word but um, I just thought it was interesting because using anger to hold others accountable makes you feel better and it makes the situation better and i think that that's an interesting way to think about anger towards others it's natural right so the whole greek thing is all of this stuff is natural it's just <laughs> you have to find the middle ground right um so they they all want you to understand yourself like your capacity for evil, like you could do something this bad, right? Uh, yeah, you have to understand that. I could do that. I could stab my husband to death because he killed my oldest kid, right? Which is really just, he wounded, he psychologically wounded my child. I could destroy the marriage, you know? I could, you know, I get that. It's just, do you wanna do it or not, right? So I do think you should, it's important to have empathy. And he says that too, right? He just doesn't point out, well, that's the whole, <laughs> this old system of education because they don't know, because they don't, they weren't taught that stuff, but that's okay. Um, so he does say both revenge is a natural hunger and forgiveness is also natural. So to say that we are by nature one way or the other. That again, you end up with Aristotle. We're by nature neither. Uh, okay, Mary Hannah, what do you think? Um, that just made me think about the whole eye for an eye thing. And I don't know if you talked about that in the video, but um, about how it's like an even revenge type thing. Like if you slap me, I don't shoot you, but if you slap me, I can slap you back. Like it almost, you know, but then that led me to thinking like, you know, there's a men don't hit women. So then I was like, so what? Are the, what's the revenge for if a woman slaps a man? Can a man slap a woman? But that just got me into thinking about that. But then that kind of, um, that was one of my points that I wrote down also about how they talked about how Athens lost the rule of law. Um, Cause I feel like we're under this superstition that like money equals power. And I'm not sure if we talked about that, but these notes, if I would have talked about it yesterday, I would understand a lot more. But like, I think in today's world, people do think 
money buys you, like you more than it should. Like, I feel like in a high school that I went to, your image got you higher up than your experience or um, like your capabilities. It wasn't just, it was like who you are and who you know. And I just feel like that's wrong. Um, so that's another thing. And I was asked a question yesterday, but I was talking about the wrong article and then we didn't have time. So in that article, um, you had said when using science, it can justify why it's okay to just have a society that feeds into like earthly things, or it can also justify why you have to turn to Jesus, like when it comes to revenge. And I was confused on like what, how, you know, I don't really know if you could explain. Well, he said, um, he said, uh, anger is a measurable sati satiation. Like if you look at neurons or something, uh, when people take revenge, it's like they were hungry or thirsty and they had a drink, right? They satisfied this visceral need. But he also says that we, also, we forgive each other all the time, right? We do it many times a day. And he uses the example of his children. I mean, I think that's where you really learn it the most because a kid will scream at you and you have sleep deprivation and you know, you know, they don't know what they're doing. So you absolutely learn that the way somebody treats you is disconnected from how you treat them, right? You just have to look beyond yourself. Having kids really, if that doesn't get you outside of yourself, uh, I don't know what will, but in general, right? All the time, if you allowed every annoying thing that like your spouse does or your friend does, you wouldn't have any friends, right? I mean, you might be honest and say that's annoying for this reason, but you're not going to confront people all the time. You forgive them all the time. You could go through that in a day and think about how many times a day you actually do that because it becomes like second nature. It's just sometimes it comes to a head and you you feel like you have to make a choice. Does that make sense, Mary Hannah, that Jesus forgiving, there's a, there's a biological foundation. That's a, a certain capacity. We could live that way. Um, it just, it's very extreme. And um, it really, I think, well, anyway, that's why I like the union of the Greek with the Christian, because you can't run a society that way, right? So, um, okay, Michael. Um, like Mary Hannah, I uh, also would have been a little well-versed, yes, more well-versed yesterday. I'm actually having some issues reading my handwriting today, so um, bear, <laughs> bear with me. Um, but you kind of brushed on one of the things that I was going to talk about, and um, I pulled a couple quotes, um, but one of them was, our ability to cooperate with each other is built upon forgiveness. So you, um, and then the other one was, you can't, this one's kind of longer, but bear with me, you can't get organisms willing to hang in there with each other through thick and thin and make, a, and make good things happen, despite the roadblocks and bumps along the way, if they aren't willing to tolerate each other's mistakes. And so this went um, kind of back when you were talking about how uh, just a second ago, you're talking about how, you know, in our day to day, we constantly um, forgive people, but we don't really think about it as forgiveness um, because it's just, it's a part of our day. But, you know, like we wouldn't be able to function and work with others if, you know, you ask somebody to, I, I don't know, you ask somebody to write the, the data on the board. They didn't. Well, you know, in your mind, you might be mad for a second, but we don't really think about that as forgiveness, um, which kind of moves into another point that I was going to make, and that was um, that he did a really good job of um, talking about forgiveness uh, and just being like smaller uh, and smaller things, because uh, typically like when I think about forgiveness and I think as a whole when we think about forgiveness, uh, we think about it um, dealing with like much larger things like your best friend just stole your boyfriend. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like something, you know, much like bigger and not so like, I guess, trivial. Um, and um, they talked a lot about, let's see, um, 
a lot of people think of forgiveness in more heroic thought, like balm for wound, whereas it's really more often like a band-aid on a scrape. Um, so that was another one of the um, things that I pulled. And I had some other stuff. Again, I really cannot figure out what some of my handwriting says. So. Oh, good. I'm glad you have to type your assignment. Yeah. Uh, every once in a while, I have a student and I think, why do they hand this into me when I have to grade it? I mean, aren't they a little worried? <laughs> I mean, the energy I take to read it, I'm just, they're going to get a lower grade. I just can't even read it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, Michael, you got to type. Huh? Um, anybody else who wants to go next on revenge? Um, oh, I just was going to say I agree with Michael. It's kind of like just getting over it and not really forgiving someone. I think that's neat that you pointed that out. Okay, Titus, go ahead. All right, I didn't have too much. Like I just had and kind of open question on both one on revenge and one on forgiveness. I do have a, my question on revenge is, and this is just for you to either think about or you can say your opinion if you want, but do you think people crave revenge to the point or do you think people revenge till they're satisfied when the person you're taking revenge on experience what you experience or feel the way you feel? Or do you think they have to go through a little worse for you to be satisfied? Like I know the common sense answer may seem to feel the way you feel, but think of it in an angered perspective. I personally feel like, you know, to um, to quench that that craving would be to make them feel worse. Um, I feel like that's more like difficult. he started it, right? The other guy started it, so <laughs> that was just something I've been thinking about. And for forgiveness. I was just wondering, I know it's kind of both, but do you think it's more often that you forgive just for the satisfaction of your conscience? Or do you think you forgive because it's, you don't feel it's worth your effort to take revenge? I think the second one, more as it's almost like the getting over it. It's like you get tired of holding that grudge or that friendship, it's just like, what's the point in hating someone for this long or holding that grudge for that long? So, I mean, that's just how I am. Let me give you an example of something that a student told me about that seemed so inappropriate that would, um, so this one sorority had expected to win the president's cup and then they didn't. Do you guys know about, you know, this president's cup stuff? Um, and they really took it all out on, I think, the president who had worked really hard on it. Like they blamed her. <laughs> and she came to my office, she was crying. But don't you think that's really inappropriate? Um, I mean, I've been a judge on that. And, you know, all of them can do, she could have done her job really well. It's not her fault. Um, so I, right. So the thing is, what is she supposed to do? She's supposed to like take revenge and quit and just, right. <laughs> or what, what should she do? Like, how should she heal those relationships? I, I don't know, you know, but I wasn't in sororities or anything, but I do think probably students learn a lot about relationships when they do get involved in all this stuff. And um, so I, I just have a lot of students who learn a lot about people and relationships while they're at Lyon because they volunteer for all this kind of stuff. And it's a big learning experience, but a lot of that is sociability, like learning not to hold a grudge against people. Does that make sense? That would, yeah, I, I'm sure that happens with sports too. 
Again, there were no sports for women when I was in high school, okay? Title IX was passed when I was a senior, and I had no idea that sports was about anything other than winning games. I honestly didn't until my children were in sports. And then you know, oh, <laughs> it's about the team. And it's, I mean, there's all sorts of growing up that gets done and leadership and teamwork and all that stuff. Uh, so I appreciate the scholar athlete of the um, model. Um, and that involves a lot of forgiveness, right? And a lot of not holding a grudge against the teammate or against the coach or something like that. Um, emotions can get pretty high because people want to win and all these things happen. So I do think it's really good practice for, you know, life. Um, who else wants to go? What have we got? Jason, your turn. Uh, yeah. Um, I think on the topic of like forgiveness, it's kind of crazy because I remember when you were saying that we could, there was a little leniency on what we could write about our paper. And then what I was thinking about before um, was like, is to forgive to, is like forgiving and forgetting, you know, like, you know, a lot of people say, you know, to forgive is to forget, but like, what does that actually mean? Because like, uh, like they say to forgive is to forget, but like, do you really forget, like if you, if, if you really forget, if you think about it, if you really forget to me, that's like you like truly forgiving you, like you've moved on, you've done, like had your, your demons with it, all you, done all your battles, but um, to, for, to me, it's more of the forgetting part. It's more of the, I think the forgiving is, I would say uh, easier, but it's more of the forgetting. Cause once you think about it, you know, you, you're in your head, it's always in the back of your head. It will always be in the back of your head. And, I think um, once you get over the forget, that's when you can truly forgive is when you forget the whole incident. And like Michael said, um, I think we use forgiveness for more of like bigger things, uh, certain things, not necessarily the little smaller things that uh, go on throughout our lives, but more of like, if like you and a friend had a really big fallout or you and your parents got no argument or you and your significant other um you know just something big instead of some smaller but i think that was what i what i was just trying to get at with like the forgiveness part of it okay so the paper if you looked at the paper topics um this article is not for the first paper this would be for the second paper um what about um learning right so i think the ancient wisdom literature when you have a critical situation how you deal with it and the education, the way you educate yourself, right? So what did I learn from that experience is a way to process it and transcend it without forgetting it. Does that make sense, Jason? If you forget, you might just make the same mistake again. <laughs> so it's just kind of being able to recognize a pattern and also recognize that this isn't just you, you know, this is, uh, this is human beings, I'm just a human being. But some human beings seek wisdom, and some don't. That's probably the only difference. It's how they process an event, not just the event. Does that make sense to you, uh, Jason? Kind of. Kind of. Okay, Mary Hannah, what do you think? Um, that just made me think of like us like struggling to forgive others or like forgiving before like we've actually taken anything from it. I think that's why like the one of the biggest reasons why we struggle to trust others. Like I know in the video uh, for today's uh, how you talked about uh, how you read the essays from other students and how it was kind of like people like it, it's so hard for others to trust people and to trust systems and stuff like that and I just think that um that is one of the biggest reasons or can be because of us thinking about past experiences of a time where we can't really depend on them because they've done something to us in the past yeah okay, so just okay. To relate those. right so let me see Jason um 
if you could, you forgive, but you think about, okay, how can I avoid that situation again? Or did that reveal some kind of a character weakness in me? Or did it reveal a character weakness in the other person? How did I get into this situation? That's what I'm thinking, right? You can prevent it and you can move on. You probably do that anyway. But technically, when you just say forget, it means, you know, you didn't sort of process it that way. But that's what, you know, wisdom, the wisdom tradition is trying to help you actually figure out a context so you can move to a higher level. Um, all right. Who else? Trey, what about you? Uh, so I think that revenge varies in like many different ways. Um, if we're like adding sports into revenge, I guess like for football, if somebody hit me too hard, I'm gonna just be looking at it and I'm gonna be trying and I'm gonna be eyeing that person for the rest of the game until like I get my revenge back. And then I won't I won't feel good until I, I know that I done settled my peace with with that with that part of revenge. So uh, definitely that's that's a different type of revenge. And and I feel like it can be I feel like revenge can be good and bad, but morally bad because there's always it's always something bad when going with revenge. And I think um, another different way of like revenge varies is like let's say something happened to where like uh, uh, one of your family members was affected by another, and then it kind of gets like it's a it's a personal type of revenge then because you're 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 more likely to be like more more thinking about it and like in like overwhelmed by the fact that it happened and stuff. So I just feel like there's many different types of uh, revenges in a way. And then for forgiveness, I feel like it's like, I feel like forgiveness is key to life because uh, although somebody could hurt you, you can't like continue to be hurt by that fact. And you can't just let that, like what it may say, you can't like hold on to a grudge because that's not really like moving on with life and like, you know, going forward. It's kind of, it's kind of like, holding on to the past if you keep on like letting it affect you and stuff like that. So I think it's always good to to be forgiving for others because whether whether you think it's good or bad, it's always going to end up good in some type of way. So that's that's Mr. Um, uh, Newland's idea of transcending, right? Okay, so what about capital punishment? The example was about capital punishment, right? Bud Welsh, his daughter was killed in the Oklahoma bombing. And the first reaction was just fry the guy. He shouldn't even have a trial, right? This is ridiculous. Go ahead, Michael. Um, yeah, so when I, they were talking about that part, uh, when they were discussing that, uh, one of the things that stood out to me that they got to is that um, forgiveness, it was, some, okay, again, the handwriting, but I, this, is the, this was the gist. Um, forgiveness isn't one step, but rather an incremental process. Um, and they attributed that to the father, you know, actually being able to um, get over what had happened. Um, and that like a lot of people saw it as just as like, oh, um, you know, I think what it was is the dad went and talked to the other person's dad or something like that. Um, and he saw another father who just lost their child or something, or was losing their child. I don't know. Something like it was that. Tim McVeigh's dad. Okay, the guy who did it, the father of the guy who did it. Right. Um, and, um, and then it talked about how a lot of people in the news just assumed that the father whose daughter had um, passed, that he would just like instant forgiveness. Um, but then they go on to talk about how it wasn't instant forgiveness and how it was an incremental process. Um, and so that was one of the things that stood out to me when it was being discussed. Anybody else want to talk about that, the, that case and the father decided capital punishment doesn't solve anything? Um, well, yeah, I wanted to point out, you know, the factors that develop it. So McCullough just says, yeah, well, let's get down and dirty and look at the details, right? First of all, um, 
Bud Welsh has to, had to have confidence that McVeigh was going to get life without parole, right? He's not going to, this is not going to happen again, and he will suffer. So the rule of law, you have to trust the rule of law, right? And um, then when he met up with the dad, you know, he had empathy. He could understand, you know, the kid was play baseball, just like every other little kid. And so there was, and that's true. You just walk around any neighborhood and you watch kids and kids are kids, you know? <laughs> um, so somehow the cycle of life in some sense just keeps being a cycle, but in other senses, each of our lives move forward and we develop a unique history. And then our country has a history and the world has a history. So certain things are linear and then there's that cycle, right? And so we're always sort of playing on those things. Um, but again, when we get to, that's why we have to get to the, the stress and then the, those articles about those grandmas, those grandparents that have no trust or goodwill for other people, right? And so even in, yeah, so Bud Welch uh, had, um, uh, accepted the rule of law. And that's one of the problems in our country right now is that we don't trust other people. We carry guns, right? We don't even trust the rule of law. And uh, I don't, that isn't necessarily evidence-based, okay? That the number of murders committed compared to the past, all this stuff, if you just look at the data, so a lot of it has to do with just the spirit of the times. So you do have to be careful about that. Go ahead, Michael. Um, in a different context, not necessarily to, not necessarily to carrying guns, because um, that usually tends to be like the idea of self-protection and you know public right. places and whatnot. Um, but I mean, I think it is fair for people to not trust the trust the law. Um, because it does seem to be, you know, a relatively um, corrupt system um, in different aspects other than what you had just mentioned. Okay, so actually you just have to be specific, right? Um, in, you know, which respect, right, that murderers won't get taken to court or um, that white collar crime, rich people who steal other people's money or don't pay taxes, right? That, but you don't get out a gun for that. I mean, there's a lot of, the rule of law covers a whole lot of stuff. Um, but Mr. Welch did uh, have the confidence that Tim McVeigh, right, was caught. And so he wouldn't have to carry around a gun, right? Um, okay. So, yeah, I, I guess just in general, looking at the rule of law is important and seeing if it works and then making sure your opinions are evidence-based, figuring out what sufficient evidence is, you know, what kind of evidence do you need? How much do you need to have sufficient evidence and all that stuff. But, um, and then the last example was Israel and Palestine and Uganda and South Africa. I mean, those are really serious cases where there's been a collapse in civilization. How do you, how do you bring people back together? Um, in a lot of ways, uh, there's a lot of appeal to mothers of small children because they just wanna move on, right? They don't want this revenge because then their kids are gonna grow up crippled and harmed and all that. So that's often a place where people who want change, they'll appeal to the mothers of small children. Um, okay, so let's go to, what was the next one? Depression. All right, um, go ahead, let's see. Who have we got? Oh, like, like, no wait, Lekesne. You haven't done the uh, revenge yet, sorry. I wrote your name down. <laughs> All right, so my topic is for beginners and events, kind of remains to trades. Uh, for events, uh, 
if it's like it depends, like if it's a physical attack against me, uh yeah, I want revenge or something like that. But like if it's like a spiritual or emotional attack on me, like probably related to some or somebody really knows, um that'd be easy not to hold the grudge against, even for to forgive, because um it's just certain stuff just don't get to me. like if people say stuff as long as they don't like physically attack me and for the topic of forgiveness um Mikala, <laughs> he said that uh forgiveness led to uh has led to human survival more than vengeance and i agree with that because um if everybody doing physical attacks against each other, it's not gonna stop it. So basically, everybody should be gone. Could you like? Could you speak slower? Or I don't know. Can other people understand? I don't like. I think it's kind of lag. I don't know why. Just um, maybe speak slower. Are other people having any trouble understanding? If you're not, oh well, then you know it's just me. <laughs> All right. Uh, he said that forgiveness led to, has led to human survival more than vengeance, and I agree with that because if everybody got physical attacks against each other, uh, it's not gonna stop till everybody gone, everybody dead. So, uh, yeah, that's all I got. Does anybody else have a comment? Okay, so, all right, so those are things to keep in mind. Um, okay, the next one is depression, right? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, sorry, this is before depression. I just, just trying to, wasn't there like, uh, when they were talking about, um, you, you know, some of those, those countries and they were talking about how um, they've gotten to a point where they're just like, they're kind of tired of the whole revenge thing um, and how some of them are just like, laying down the guns, yada, yada. Um, but then didn't they talk about how like revenge was actually like some of the stability of the countries, didn't they? I, I might've been misinterpreting again, I can't remember exactly, but didn't they discuss like something about how um, they're seeing like, you know, almost increased violence after some of these people are trying to kind of lay down their arms, that kind of thing, uh, just because it was, it was something that the, the, the countries had been like built on and used to for so long. Okay, so when the USSR collapsed, right, then the old animosities came up. Were you thinking of that? I think so. That might have been what it was. Yeah, there actually the USSR had maintained some order between these countries. Well, the same with Saddam Hussein, right? That's, yeah, that's what I was referring to. I couldn't remember, but yeah, I wanted to hear what you had to say about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've, you know, kept up with that or I used to. Um, okay, so uh, the West decided on the political boundaries of these different countries, okay? And they deliberately made those boundaries so the countries would be internally weak so that we could buy cheap oil, okay? Why? How? Okay. So they would, and you could tell, just look at Africa. It has Muslims in the north and, you know, indigenous people in the south. So you're pitting them against each other. Okay. So that happened in the Mideast. You have a, there's a natural tribe, the Kurds, and they got cut into three pieces between the Turks, the Iranians, and the Iraqis. Okay. And then Iraq in particular got divided between the Sunnis, the Shia, and the Kurds. And the reason to do that is that you have this animosity then within the country. And so you could make deals and uh, business people did make deals with the Kurds, for example. And okay, if you sell us your cheap oil, we'll give you weapons to protect you against the Sunni and the Shia, okay? So Saddam comes in there and he unites the people against the West, right? 
we're going to get our oil. We're going to keep our oil. We're going to sell at a decent price. We're not, not going to let the West exploit us. You know, there were a lot of people that liked Saddam for good reason. And so the scholars were saying, if you go in there and you, you know, topple Saddam, there's going to be all these civil wars. Um, and, and there were. It's just that corporations can still can make a lot of money selling cheap oil if the country remains politically broken. Does that make sense? Okay. And so, yeah, Saddam did stop a lot of uh, revenge between the Sunni, the Shia, and the Kurds. Um, and the USSR stopped a lot between the Serbs and the, what, the Muslims and the, oh, Croatians, Croatians and Serbs in, in Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia. And um, it is interesting to see those patterns, actually, they're pretty predictable. Um, so Iraq is still a mess. And um, I haven't kept up on how much money oil companies are making from cheap Iraqi oil. But the fact that it's politically so weak would be to their advantage for the most part. Um, all right, let's see. So let's go to, um, so let's go to depression, right? Depression, who wants to start, anybody? I know that when I first came to Lyon, um, the students, you know, I don't know because nobody talked about it, but I, I think there were way fewer students that had been diagnosed depressed and that had been on antidepressants. So I think it has increased quite a bit for better or worse, whatever. I'm, I don't know, you know, I don't make judgments about that. Um, okay, so let's see. Trey, you want to start? So, my thoughts on depression, I don't really know much about it, but I know that it's a serious, like, thing. Um, I think, I think depression is, I think it can overwhelm you if you think on it too much. And I think uh, like if you're, if you're going through it a lot, it can like definitely weigh a toll on you and, and how you react and, and your emotions and stuff. Um, I would say that I, I, I would, I, if it would be best to like help people with depression because it can get to a serious cause or something serious could possibly happen because they could possibly feel like they're at their lowest point and and they might not feel like they have like a lot of people or a lot of help or, or you know references or people to talk to and I, I'm not really sure but I feel like if I was in a depressed state I wouldn't really want to talk to people or explain my emotions or what I'm going through so it could, I guess that would be like really bad for like somebody and to think that like they wouldn't have anything or have anybody to like go to or talk to or somebody that they could rely on could be a really serious matter. So that's just really what I, th I think. I think it's a, a serious problem or a serious cause that could really affect somebody's moral being and stuff. Okay, um, McKesney. Oh, okay. Titus, you wanna go? Yeah, I was just going to say that I believe depression, it's really all about empathy. And it's kind of funny because this morning I was looking at an article about it that I was frantically trying to pull back up just now. But it was about, it talked about seemingly harming, harmless things that can be toxic for someone with depression. And it's basically for those people who want to help or more specifically think they're helping but they're actually just making things worse because they don't truly understand their situation like one of the quotes that they said was basically everything happens for a reason and in reality yes it sounds like it can help but really they say 
when there's something causing them such intense suffering, it can be hurtful to try and find a way to justify it. For example, like what if their background was in sexual abuse? You can't just say it happens for a reason. So it's really about empathy. You have to know what they're going through and you have to understand it so you can work towards a path of getting over it. Yeah, okay, good. Um, I think what a therapist does for the most part, I think, is just listen, I think, and then take your side, right? Like a therapist is on your side. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's about this inner dialogue. Somehow you've gotten so down on yourself and you can't get out of that loop. Or the one guy says you get to the point where there's nothing, like you're just dead inside, which is kind of scary, right? It's dark. Um, you, you're, it, the opposite of depression is vitality, right? You just don't engage with the world at all. Remember when Parker Palmer said, people say, hey, Parker, it's a sunny day outside. It's beautiful. Why don't you go outside? It just makes it more obvious to Parker that he is so disconnected from the world and that makes you more depressed, <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. So it's like when people said to my friend Hope Parker when her kid died, oh, you can always have another one. Oh my God, right? People aren't interchangeable. <laughs> yeah, plug one, unplug one, plug in another one. Yeah. Uh, so kind of be careful what you say. <laughs> uh, so Lekesny, did you have something about that article about depression? Yes, ma. Uh, uh, I feel like most of all, a lot of people want the episode, some sort of episode of depression. Uh, I mean, the article, that was, uh, I never thought about it like this, but uh, they related to uh, um, the Valley of Shadow of Death. In a way, it kind of made sense to me because when you're depression, you kind of, uh, it's like your dark place, kind of, and you're pretty down. And to me, um, you should try to emphasize, like uh, Tice related, you should try to emphasize empathy for those with depression. Um, um, <laughs> and yeah, those, those about it. And to kind of go off what he said, another one of those quotes that were commonly said between those who were obviously trying to help was, they say, I've been through it too. That's probably something you should never really say because they always, every depressed person feels their own situation is unique. But really it's understanding that their situation is much more complex than what you're making it out to be. So that's just another reason for how for how important empathy is. Yeah. Do you ever get into conversations where somebody talks about some obstacle, you know, and then other people, oh, I had that, you know, as if that's going to help. And it, it's just kind of like drawing attention to yourself, right? <laughs> or... Yeah. I think like some people try to like one up people with their experiences. They're like, oh, you went through this. Well, look what I went through. Like theirs isn't equal or they don't have the right to be hurt by it. Well, there's the competitive side, but there's just the totally oblivious side, right? That all you can think about is yourself, you know? Um, and you might even think that this is, oh, this is really a bonding experience. <laughs> uh, but I do think like 
it is indicative that a professional therapist's main job is just to shut up and listen. And um, I think one, I mean, I do think it's important to know that depression has existed for thousands of years, right? This isn't just a disease of modern society, right? Um, but also that what a therapist does is what used to be somebody in the extended family used to do, you know? There were women at home, and if they were good at playing the role of the kind of, they would be listeners. Does that make sense? like the standard traditional housewife, the kid would come home from school and pretty much recite everything, every thought they ever had, everything I wanted to tell, right? Just that need for somebody to listen um, is a lot of what a therapist does. And then also have, well, I, I think of empathy as, yes, I've been through that. I think of sympathy as, I haven't been through it, but I'm listening, right? I care about this. Does that make sense? I, that's just, it's just a distinction. You do have to make that distinction. Um, I haven't, you can't identify with it, but you can just care about it. That's all. Um, let's see, who else? Okay, Mary Hannah, what do you think? Yeah, I'll go next. I made a few um, points throughout the reading and video. Um, one was how he talked about people respond different, um, differently, like to different things, like parenting techniques, and then about like the different depressants that you can. We lost you. <laughs> She's gone. Oh, that's too bad. She usually is, you know, the thing doesn't shut down. Got bad luck. Um, okay, Caitlin, we'll just have to do you until Mary Hannah comes back. Um, okay, so I had a few points. Um, Me. One of the first things. Me. Oh, is she on me? All right. <laughs> <laughs> This happens at my other school all the time, but okay, Mary Hannah, we're going to put you on. Oh, she disappeared. Okay, Caitlin, go ahead. Okay, so the first thing that really stuck out to me, um, so the Solomon person, I didn't, can't remember who exactly. Um, Andrew. Yeah, he, he said he felt that medications returned him to the, himself, like when he was depressive and he was put on medications. That's one thing that, um, because like I'm a psychology major and so I have kind of strong opinions about this stuff but personally I don't like medications um I think that actually going to therapy is better overall I think that some people benefit from medications but I also think that a lot of the time it gives more bad than what good can come from it um so that's just really the first thing that really stuck out to me um the second thing he said, he said, depression is the flaw in love. And then he was saying, without depression, we couldn't experience intimacy. Love couldn't exist without a range of other emotions. And sadness and pain is essential to love and attachment. And so I kind of didn't really agree with some of that. I can see like his stance with, um, especially with sadness and pain relating to like attachment. But when it comes to like love, I feel like you don't have to experience like pain and sadness to be able to love. Like I, um, I see how he thinks that you can gain love from depression and sadness, but I don't think that it's essential to being able to love and experience intimacy, but yeah. Okay, any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with the first thing you said about medicine not being a solution for me. I just believe it's a temporary fix. Honestly, I believe it's more of a business thing than anything because all it does is cover up the depression. It doesn't fix anything. It doesn't go to the root of your depression. Like I'd understand if it was 
some type of biological thing that needed to be fixed or removed, like a disease or possibly a virus. But since this is psychological, you can't just fix it with a medicine or just take just take two pills of this and you'll be done. Like you'll be temporarily fixed, but it won't help anything in the long run. Okay. Um, I think a part of the reading was talking about its biological basis, wasn't it? I mean, it's somewhat of a biological basis. I'm not disagreeing. I think it's also psychological, but. Well, so Caitlin, when you study psych, right? Do they say, do, you know, have you, do you have a class where they study research about uh, the relation between medications and just talk therapy? Um, yeah, this, it, it comes up a lot. Um, really, like when people are prescribed medications, they're also recommended to go to therapy. But majority of the time, a lot of people want the medication and don't feel comfortable going to therapy. And that's really the combination where you get the most benefit. And I just personally, I think that like Tata said, medication can kind of just be like a cover up where you're not dealing with the actual problem. And I also think that I know people who take medication and it benefits them a lot. So I can't say that it's always bad, but just I believe that sometimes the symptoms and other things that come and not going to therapy also just brings a lot, a whole another set of problems. So so the therapy part is the power of ideas, right? That's the philosophy. Like you have to change your ideas and also often your situation, like who you're relating to, who you're talking to. Um, yeah, and so I think Krista Tippett and Andrew Solomon uh, said, especially Tippett, she said it has to be combined with therapy, right? Um, so both of them sounds like, especially Solomon, has been a pretty rigid, uh, you know, a lot of different meds. Um, so I would imagine that his brain chemistry, there's a chemistry there. Uh, then the question is, right, how much can ideas pull people out? I would imagine it just depends on the person, right? And And also it just seems like you would the goal of therapy is to get people off the meds, right? But you have to have a balance and you have to gradually decrease the quantity and all that stuff. Um, but the uh, whole idea from the beginning would be you have to really change your worldview, your orientation toward life. And you have to be more proactive about the situations you get yourself into. You try to not repeat what you've done before in terms of relationships. Does that make sense, Caitlin? I... Uh, yeah, it definitely does. And also like um, when I read the list of medications, it kind of just like shocked me, especially how he, that, that list of medications. And then shortly after he said, he felt like the medications returned him to himself. And like when she questioned like alter changing the brain chemistry and his, thoughts and yeah I don't know it just didn't really sit right with me so that just kind of made me curious I guess well you should you should listen to the interview right uh, it's just wow this guy he's smart you know oh I mean I yeah it's way over my head it's just that when the profit motive gets in there right Titus you just kind of get suspicious. Too many people are making too much money off of this stuff. Uh, and they want to believe they're right. So they, they just want to believe that they're doing a good thing. Then the question is, are they, right? They might be tragic characters. They might be, you know, cynical, but I think it's more likely they would be tragic, right? That they have good intentions and they, they're just making a mistake. So I think there is an adequate enough consideration that you might be a tragic character. Does that make sense, Caitlin? That if people really do think they're in it to help people and not for the money, 
that therefore they are, therefore they're right, or they, that's far enough. You don't just consider that, that, you know, my good intentions don't get me off the hook. Does that make sense, Caitlin? Yeah, and I also feel like sometimes, like when when doctors prescribe medication, it's just just to like give them something to help, but not fix the problem. Like we talked about just a couple minutes ago, it's it's not like the like pharmaceutical come like the whole network is just about making money. And even if it doesn't come directly from the doctor, who because the doctor is wanting to help, and sometimes you know they just see the medicine as um, just healthy. And so it's not always about the money, but like in the bigger picture from like big company standpoints, it is the money. So it's just well, frustrating. Well, some doctors, you know, it, it can get caught up with money. Like if they get to be known as a doctor that prescribes it, they'll get more patients, right? So there can be. Um, so I would say the majority of them probably have good intentions, but then that doesn't necessarily mean they're right. So that's that's a case where lots of research helps too. Um, but this, you know, the approach of Tippett is the idea that we are spiritual creatures, right? We want to live for the sake of something greater than ourselves. And depression just totally det detaches us from this orientation, right? We can't go anywhere. So it isn't just a feeling, right? It's just a complete loss of vitality and a loss of spirit, spirituality. Um, I guess the thing that shocked me was when his mother deliberately committed suicide because she was suffering from cancer and that threw him into this huge depression. Uh, that sort of worried me because I had thought if my life got really bad, right, that I might do something like that. Now I know, no, because no matter what my son might think, just the thought that that would be possible would prevent me from doing that. Um, so that was, that's another thing, but okay. Another point I want to get to my one last point. Okay. Mary Hannah, you just go ahead, Mary Hannah. I'm so sorry. I don't even know what's going fault? on. It's like my connection is, it's like storming and I don't know what's going on. I live in like a dungeon anyways. Okay. So um, a few points that I made throughout or if we're still in depression, I don't know how much I missed. Yeah, we're still, we're still on it. <laughs> well, before I went out, I was talking how people respond differently to different things. And an example I wanted to give was um, my high school coach. Like his method was like being intense with everybody, like in your face, yelling at you, like super hard. But some people, it motivated them. And some people, it like it tore them to pieces. Like they just couldn't handle it. And I just thought, that's just what that made me think of. And you have to approach people in different ways and talk about parenting. And I think that's right in parenting too. But um, also there was a question on how religious upbringing has affected my adulthood. And I don't want to go too um, deep into that. I don't know what I want to say about that. But I think that um, your religious, like your religion, it just kind of helps keep away depression. Um, I just got lost my train of thought. But just for the fact of we kind of rely on our like hope and faith and like the hopes of the future that's like not that's kind of promised and like afterlife and things that like we could lose that would tear us apart. But because of our religion and our faith, like we don't get as far about it. And I think that's affected my adult life because I can depend on that when I need to depend on something. And then um I don't know what everyone's talked about, but I think I wrote down like one result of depression is that you learn to appreciate your need for people. You had said that. And I think that through like quarantine and every issue I've ever had, like basketball, that was a real struggle. Being a freshman, that's hard too. Like um, anytime something's changing, it kind of stretches you out. And I think that kind of overwhelms you. And I think 
that's whenever you need people the most to kind of go through it with you and to motivate you through it just to be in your circle. So that's really what I had. Okay, so the point uh, for Mr. Newland that rigid, rigid religion was terrible and it created all this guilt. And for Mr. Solomon, that rigid religion created a structure, right? Okay, so people respond differently. Within the same family, a kid will respond differently, right? It's just that you always know the goal is to help that child flourish, right? Um, and then, okay, so Caitlin, the need for people, I would say you don't have to have the experience of pain to have love, but love is a need. And so with the people you love, it's easier to get hurt or to hurt them because you love them, but it's not necessary. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Jason, haven't called on you yet. Um, I don't really have anything to say. I guess I was just listening to what everybody else had to say. And uh... Okay, so, um, so yeah. In, in, yeah, in terms of this class, we have Aristotle's virtues and we have related to personal things. And so I don't want to make this into amateur hour, you know, where we don't have the evidence we need. So I'm trying to emphasize this is in relation to the human spirit, right? Because I really, you know, there's way too much I don't know. Um, but, you know, people still deal with it in a very amateurish way, right? So we at least have to sort out some of, some of the distinctions at that level. Um, okay, now we've got stress. And so I think everybody would probably be able to clock in on stress. Um, does anybody want to start? Well, let's see. Jason, do you want to start? Did you do something on stress? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll um, I guess I'll go. Um, I guess, um, I guess one thing about, uh, okay, let me, I'm just going to be on, I did not do the reading again. I'm so sorry, but um, I'm just going to go off the top here. And uh, I think when it comes to stress, that plays a, a huge role into um, depression, what we were talking about earlier. Um, I think that can like play a big role and it, it, weighs, it weighs down on you, I think as a person, but I think in terms for everybody as well. So um yeah, it's, I have much to say. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, when you read it, her thing is that it's actually a, there's a physiological response, right? So it's natural to respond to dangers, right? If you feel vulnerable, stress is natural. It's just that you can get that loop so it won't turn off. <laughs> and so there's this autoimmune response. So sometimes you're, you're, body chemistry doesn't work and it gets going in high gear and it just doesn't turn off. And sometimes it doesn't turn on, right? Either one is gonna make you sick. So there is this balance. Again, you've got balance. So you've got a physiological balance and but it's related to psychological balance, right? And it's related to emotional balance. And it's related to letting yourself feel things um not getting hyper intellectual because then you won't uh it's just you're gonna screw up your your system um so esther sternberg is a scientist and she at first thought that stuff was all stupid and then she experienced some of it and she went to greece of course and uh, literally got physically better as she started also settling down her thoughts and meditating and giving herself some time to reflect. And so she's just saying, look, there's this mind-body connection that literally controls, affects the immune response so that you do avoid overreacting or so that your body will shut off <laughs> the machine, right? Um, okay, so... 
let's see. Um, how about Michael? Because maybe, I don't know if your research has anything to do with this, but go ahead. No, my research has nothing to do with this. Um, uh, but I actually didn't pull a whole lot from the stress article, but one of the things that um, at the very beginning it touches on, um, so one of the older perceptions of stress was that it's the body's non-specific response to any demand. Um, and then it kind of moved into, it's, our, it's, it's actually about our perception of what we consider stressful as individuals. Um, and then like you go towards like the very end of the article and it was talking about psychotherapy and how we practice things and how when we practice stressful things, we relearn how to perceive these stressful events in less stressful ways. Um, so one of the ways it was talking about like, um, like a runner's high, uh, the one specific example from the writer was how she likes to swim. And when she gets like 15 minutes or so, she's, you know, she's like hit this point where it's just like, it's just peaceful, you know? Um, and so I thought that was really interesting, uh, just about the idea of, um, I guess, putting ourselves through these stressful events to begin to unlearn them as stressful and perceive them as less stressful. Um, so that was probably, the, that, was, that was the biggest point that I had. Um, yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, you wanna go, Titus? Yeah, well, one thing I wanna say is that runner's high, that's something I really wanna learn for myself because I do not have that, but. I had that for 42 years. It was good too. Mainly, I just want to say that. Just, it, re mm -hmm. it really can help your mental health. I mean, when you reduce it, but I know a lot of times personally, when you get stressed, it causes you to forget. And I'm just drawing straight off of college experience when I'm studying right before tests. I get to the point where I can literally read an entire paragraph and right after I finish reading it, I completely forget about what I just read. Then typically when I begin to calm down, realize the situation isn't as big as it seems or as I'm perceiving it, that's when I can get back on track as far as studying and stuff. So it definitely have a mental effect on you and it, the blood goes to a different part as far as brain. physically <laughs> what but, you, said? you know physiologically you can measure that right the energy is going mm -hmm. to a different part of your brain when you have a long-term memory or just an immediate reaction right and mainly for the physi physiologically outside of sleep I don't really there wasn't really any long-term effects that I know of thankfully but I know there can be some okay who else um oh uh Mary Hannah um I'll go I kind of talked about this with depression too but about how uh, I talked talked about how change triggers the stress response but I think it also like triggers emotional um like just like your emotions and your emotional response and a few people have talked about how they think that stress and depression kind of go hand in hand and I just think being stressed like so stressed can just kind of wear on your emotions to like almost make you like feel that depression but one of my um the most interesting things I read about was how when we're talking about the brain and mind topic, um, we talked about basically how people go crazy. And, you know, I never really knew how that really worked. But to think that so much stress can cause someone to basically lose their mind. Um, he said, I, oh, he said he's disconnecting. I thought he said, I'm disconnecting. I was like, oh, no, not again. I just got that notification. But also, um, this is just like what I've been taught growing up. And I think something that helps me not to be as stressed when it comes to like other people, because I think we get stressed out by involving ourselves in other people's problems. But I've always been raised on like control what only you can control. So it helps me like let things go that happen to me that I can't control or that's just one like a kind of tip 
that's helped me, especially in college. There's a lot of things like class changing or like homeworks or practices being pushed up or pushed back that things that would mess up with my homework times or stress me out. I just think like control what only you can control. And that just was really helped me. Okay. And so that expression, when people say you lose your mind, really, if you think about it, that's what Aristotle means, right? You lose your ability to keep your eye on the mark to figure out, you know, what should I do to maintain my flourishing, right? And the other people's flourishing. So when you lose track of that goal of flourishing, you lose your mind, really. Does that make sense, Mary Hannah? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so Aristotle might sound complicated and old fashioned and whatever, but it, I think it really is common sense in the final analysis. Um, and it's what we do a lot without thinking about it. Um, Lakesney, did you have a comment on the stress article? Uh, I only really had one comment on it because the other one, like, like you said, and I understand uh, stress is the change. I mean, <laughs> and what's the thing that uh triggers special spines and all that? And, um in a way too much stress um causes the body to not function, <laughs> causes the body not function. And, um that was really the only thing I had to Okay. Um let's see. Trey. stress is it's it, it's it's constant and it's never ending really because we're always kind of stressing about something um, regardless of like if it's something little or something big and then it, it it it's always like on our mind whether like like it's homework or uh, bills or stuff like that there's always like some kind of like way that it gets to you and I feel like it always kind of just is is on your mind and carrying like a little weight it's like a backpack that's always on your back or something like that but I think um I think we would live a better life or we I think we would have more fun living if we didn't have these things that we were going on that we were dealing with all the time and going through so it's just like a constant thing that really goes on Okay, Caitlin, and then we have to quit. And I'll start out, you know, sort of summarizing, maybe adding a little bit about what I said on the video, the students' comments. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> Caitlin, go ahead. Um, so I feel like I feel like stress overall is such like a wide range topic because, like, like you were saying, that constant like it's like the fight or flight response where you're just constantly stressed and I feel like there's a natural stress that's good for you so it's motivational but then there's it gets to a point where some people their stress is so they're so stuck in that fight or flight response constantly that it messes like there's just a bunch of long-term effects and I feel like especially like one of the biggest long-term effects that I can really like think of and like have seen is just like your digestive system like when you're so stressed like eating and sleeping and it's just so I feel like there's a lot of natural stress that's good and it's always going to be there we just have to learn how to deal with it and use it as like a motivation but then it gets to a point where stress can seriously like cause harmful long-term effects okay so I mean I just just something to leave you with. Um, yeah, I had a lot of obstacles I hadn't anticipated. Uh, and, I, and I thought to myself, oh, this is what it means to be an adult, right? It's, you know, everybody gets married, has kids and gets a jerk, goes to school, whatever. It's a lot more difficult than you think, just because everybody does it. So um, I just learned to tell myself, oh, this is a grown up right now I'm now I'm an adult 
and um yeah that's all everybody's this is everybody <laughs> I mean, the other side of it is, well, if I don't want stress, don't get married, don't have kids, don't, you know, go, you know, go to college, don't just get a job, you don't have to think about, you know, I don't think you really want that, right? So you just think about what do you want? If you want to flourish at a high level, then you're going to have a complicated life, that kind of thing. So I wouldn't call it stress, I would just say, okay, this is complicated, but it's what I want, right? Uh, there is this kind of word when students use the word stress, it's just like validates whatever you're feeling, right? A lot of that is, I just don't want to do what I have to do. Oh, good. <laughs> that, yeah, be careful. Be careful about validating something that you should say, what do I really want, right? This is just grown up hood. Um, okay, so I'll, I do have to clean up the website. <laughs> the readings are there, but I think the date, you know, there's some stuff I have to clean up. Um, and I'll do that after my next class. Uh, we'll end at 12 and then I'll do it. So, uh, okay, we'll see you. Bye -bye. I have a question real quick. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, usually what we do is Monday, Tuesday, we like, uh, we turn in our on Wednesday, our like class review for Monday and Tuesday right yeah okay but this week it says that there's a place to submit monday and a, a place to submit that's, tuesday that's where actually that's what i have to clean up right oh, okay last time it was different days of the week and i think yeah just ignore the monday tuesday ignore the dates um it's the same assignments and then for this class it's tuesdays wednesday noon and again, you know, in case you haven't noticed, I haven't read anything because I've, I have a lot to do. I'm not going to okay. We know. Us. I baby, you know, I got to babysit for my granddaughter, but, you know, and I don't call that stress, right? I just think there aren't enough hours in, a, in the day. So mm -hmm. I'm actually, I'm patient with you. I'll never know. I mean, actually the machine tells me when you hand it in. But I'll never punish you for handing in late because I'm not getting stuff back. Um, and so I tomorrow is the day is full. Uh, but Thursday, I don't have stuff to do during the day. So then I'll read your papers first and I'll read a post just so you can get an idea. You know, I do know that you need feedback. I apologize. But then I will be kind to you too. So, hey. <laughs> don't stress about it all right okay we'll see you bye-bye